Sir, you may start. Hello and welcome to the Neighborhood First, India's Neighborhood First series, which has been organized by the India International Center. Uh, this is the second in the series of the Neighborhood First policy of India. Last month, we did a program on India-Sri Lanka relations. Today's program is about Nepal, India-Nepal relations. And we have a great panel today to discuss those relations. Uh, let us remember that no two countries have enjoyed closer relations than India and Nepal given the open border and the affinities they enjoy, which are beyond compare. In the United States, when I was there in 1971, I went to speak at Kansas University on Nepal-India relations. One of the students in the Kansas University at that time quizzed me about, about these very uh, great relations and said that India is very lucky to have Nepal as a part of its territory. Now, I was aghast at that time that in 1976, there were well-informed students who were mistaken about Nepal being a fiercely independent, sovereign country, which had never been colonized, unlike India. Well, when I returned to India, I found the same mistake was being made, and in one instance by a film star. And, and, and this, of course, led to a series of misunderstandings. Uh, so what we have to remember is that without going into any details about the history, it can be said that the relations have witnessed high and low points. At this time, unfortunately, these relations are at one of their lowest points after 2015 which many consider as the beginning of the decline in India-Nepal relations. There are many reasons for this, and I'm sure our panelists will tell us some of the reasons for this. I have known Nepal since 1959. That is according to the Nepal calendar 2016. And since then, have been traveling and trekking in Nepal throughout the country and observing these changes that I mentioned. Similarly, India has also changed, but not as phenomenally as Nepal. It is this change that we have to remember, which is driving Nepalese nationalism as never before and pronouncing and proclaiming its independent sovereign status. Nepal today has a left wing Nepal Communist Party government, which has an unprecedented majority not seen in the history of Nepal. Anti-India sentiment, which was previously confined to the Kathmandu Valley, has spread to the hinterland, but it is not 
pro-Chinese as is optically evident. This anti-India feeling is on the decline because of some of the steps that India has taken in the recent past. And I'm sure our panelists will go into this. Uh, let me introduce our great panel. Um, Ambassador Beit Bahadur Thapa is a veteran diplomat. He was ambassador of Nepal to India for at least four to five years. And after that, he became Nepal's foreign minister. At one time, he was the finance minister of Nepal also, and has had a stint as ambassador to the United States. So he is an all-round professional diplomat and politician. Ambassador Ranjit Ray is no less. He has known Nepal since the early 90s and has handled the Nepal desk, the North desk, and has been ambassador to Hungary, Vietnam, and his last stint, and I dare say a very eventful stint, was in Nepal as India's ambassador there. Um, and of course, your third speaker is myself. Uh, the order of batting will be Ambassador Thapa, Ambassador Ranjit Ray, and myself. Um, the speakers are requested to confine their initial remarks to about seven to ten minutes, which will be followed by a Q and A. Uh, by me, and eventually a Q&A from the audience. I think we will have at least 20 minutes for that. So let's get cracking and start with Ambassador Thapa. Ambassador Thapa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Asak, and greetings to all participants and listeners. Let me start with this, with this the feeling of sadness at the passing away of Jaswan Singh, a grand old man who I had the honor and pleasure of working together, communicating together, and even socializing together when I was in New Delhi. I have fond memories of his grandeur and his very accommodating and intellectual ability. I, still have fond memories of going to his house, seeing piles of book at Tin Tin Murti Mark house and communicating with him. You know, I says, so when I heard the news, I was sad indeed, and that will linger. I'm also pleased that IRC has organized this meeting. Uh, I, mean, I was a regular at the IRC. I have participated in many uh, roundtables, discussions, and, and other, other events, not to talk of being a voracious eater of IRC's sumptuous lunch and dinners. Well, you know, given the situation we are in, the first thing that has to happen between Nepal and India is for the two governments to switch off the mute button. I think that is the first step. I have failed to understand, you know, since I've been involved in the government since 1961 and retired only recently. Not as a civil servant, but as a, as a political appointee or you know, appointed by the government for various activities. And nothing challenged me more than being ambassador in Delhi because the agenda was comprehensive, broad in its scope, and it covered every aspect of human endeavor between two countries. And no two countries have been as close 
and at, at the same time and occasionally at odds in conducting relationship. The present situation baffles me, frankly speaking. There have been ups and downs in relation that is true of every country, every neighborhood. But since, you know, uh, uh, what I have observed is in, in, in the entire history of my witnessing in Nepal-India relation, after 1964, Lal Bahadur Sastri became the Prime Minister. He came to Nepal. He was at a meeting with King Mahendra, and they two discussed alone for almost two hours. Outside in the waiting room was Edwin Afghanal, then, then Foreign Secretary, and myself. Coming up, out and escorting Lal Badruji through the palace gates, the king looked at us and said, he has a very refreshing attitude towards neighbors, not just Nepal. That seemed to have pleased him, but that is, didn't last long. But with the demise of Lal Badruji, we lost not only lost a good friend, not only India lost a very good leader. Then next, you know, I jumped to Ike Gujral's prime ministership, non-reciprocal treatment between neighbors, in which every difficult and easy issue were discussed at the foreign minister's level, at the prime minister's level. And in my map was charted to take the step, to take forward steps to minimize differences and maximize cooperation. That non-reciprocal treat treatment between two nations uh, was very attractive to the ears of the neighbors, but then that too disappeared over time. Then next I jumped to the current period, Prime Minister Modi, when he came to Nepal, after 19 years of hiatus in meeting between Prime Ministers of Nepal and India, Meeting in India, yes, frequently. Meeting in Nepal, no. But at that time, at one on one occasion, I had an occasion to meet. Uh, Ambassador Thapa, can, sorry for interrupting you, Ambassador Thapa. Yeah. Will you please speak a little loudly? Please speak more loudly. Okay. Well, then I, you know, I, I told Prime Minister Baspai, "Up Nepal, we go. Nepal, Jan, Jan." We were all waiting anxiously for him. And Bas Bhaiji, in his very charming language, say, Deko Radhu Radhu Mahade, Bachi to hoi raha hai, Aapke log yaan aana chaate hai, aai rahe hai, Bachi to hoi raha hai, Maksat to hoi hai na? That's how he sort of evaded answering. But then he did come as a part of the SART meeting in for a day. Then, uh, you know, the, the next phase is Modi's emergence as a prime minister. When he came and gave a, gave, gave a talk yeah, at our, our Samidhan Sabha, parliament, he charmed every Nepalese, not only within the confines of, the, of that hall, but beyond the entire, you know, territory of Nepal. But then, you know, it, lo and behold, then suddenly things started to change in, with, with reference to our process of finalizing the constitution. We had to face what you call, in, in uh, we call a blockade. You, you block without calling it a blockade. So these are, I'm, I'm only talk, talking about the, uh, the different phases our relations have, have passed. During Gujarat's time, the assignment to review the treaty, 1951 treaty, was assigned to two foreign governments. But the entire period since then, the two foreign secretaries have not found it convenient to meet, even once, to review the issue. So the point I'm trying to make is our relationship, you know, have gone uh, difficult periods on, on occasion, but by and large, at the people's level, it remains warm, it has remained warm, and it will remain warm despite the two governments switching up the, you know, the button, this 
might you bug the bird. Now, you know, my feeling is having dealt with India, Ranjitji and I have, have worked together. He was joint secretary in North when I was ambassador there. Very cordial relationship and very pleasant personality. You know, no issue is above solution. If there is realization at both ends of the difficulties of each other on vital issues. And every time the issue hovers around a sense of security and the various interpretation of the sense of security of each other. And uh, General Ashok, you talked about Nepal's sovereign status. You know, it has, historically, you know, it's just, you know, after we st stopped the war with the British, 1816, 1814, 16, Sugali Sandi, I think, was signed. And we stand on that, you know, even prior to that, as an independent nation, as a sovereign nation. I think our status means where it was and where it is now. So it's not a question of, of feeling about uh, or question about sovereignty, the degree of sovereignty. I think in the are now active member of the, of the in the global fora from you, you have been elected twice at the Security Council. You know, there is nothing to impede us from being in touch with the rest of the world and conducting our affairs. So we at our end need should not be concerned, duly concerned about slight utterances to undermine or to pursue your agenda at the cost of our, uh, uh, at our cost. I think there is lack of sensitivity on, uh, uh, so displayed on occasion. But then that too has surfaced and uh, in our dialogue, you know, I think to overcome some of these, there have been attempts, some, uh, but they have not gone far enough. My feeling is now some, you know, uh, t a time has reached. There was a formation of EPG in eminent person group between Modiji and uh, Oliji. That exercise is complete and it's awaiting a re a re a reception. Uh, but that apart, you know, I think the, where we stand today is in a kind of feeling of numbness that at the people's level things are moving as, as, as before. At the government level, refusal or non-dialogue is giving a sense of discomfort to the people. It has not impacted on movement or any other thing. But the psychologically, I think, you know, there is a there is an uneasiness in, in, in the air. And that needs to be overcome quickly. I think my suggestion before I end here will be to get over the areas of reservation leading towards lack of communication. And in, in, once you begin communication, you can agree, agree or disagree, but you remain engaged. Engagement is the priority at the moment, and that is what we need to aim at and move. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Thapa, uh, for that uh, very comprehensive review of relations. And two points you have really highlighted. One is the need to unmute ourselves. And the other is that besides the numbness in government to government relations, there is something that is still ticking and ticking greatly. And those are the people to people relations. Our next speaker is Ambassador Ranjit Ray. And I'm sure he will respond to some of the issues that Ambassador Thapa has raised, uh, including the points that he will make himself. The floor is yours, Ranjit. Thank you, Ashok. Uh, 
Foreign Minister Thapa has, uh, you know, provided us with a historical tour de force of India-Nepal relations. Uh, I would like to look at uh, more recent uh, developments. And, you know, I've been dealing with Nepal for, for many, many years. And this is the first time that I feel our relations are really uh, at a low. It's an all-time low. And it's not just between the two governments. I beg to differ a little bit with uh, Foreign Minister Thapa because my sense is that for the first time within the people of India, there is a certain degree of resentment uh, uh, against Nepal. And I have never witnessed this in the past. And, you know, there are several reasons for it. You know, some of the statements emanating from very high uh, political leaders in Nepal, you know, about our national emblem, the virus, uh, uh, you know, about the birthplace of Lord Ram. So all this has really percolated down uh, to our people. And of course, I must also add that the Indian media has played a, a very major role. And, uh, uh, you know, it's been a sort of high decibel uh, uh, activism. And Nepal has been portrayed on occasion uh, as if, uh, you know, it is, it is uh, an enemy country like Pakistan. So, you know, for the first time, I feel quite worried. You know, government to government relations, there's always highs and lows and things get sorted out. But at least, uh, you know, from my perspective, sitting in Delhi, I feel that uh, this time, uh, you know, the issue seems to be more serious. And of course, the, the proximate reason for this is this whole issue uh, of, of, of the boundary. And, you know, we are in a dilemma. Uh, Foreign Minister Thapa says we should unmute. And Nepal has been seeking talks uh, on the boundary issue. And as far as I'm aware, you know, before the precipitate steps were taken of issuing a new map, uh, showing uh, parts of Indian territory as Nepal, and before the constitutional amendment, uh, some initiatives were made uh, by the government of India, uh, uh, you know, to have some kind of dialogue and to, uh, to prevent uh, some of these steps uh, that were taken by Nepal. Uh, obviously, you know, that didn't uh, uh, succeed. So we are now faced with, uh, you know, the, the matter has got precipitated. And we are in a bit of a sick fix in terms of how to respond. Because on the one hand, Nepal is saying, you know, let's have a dialogue on this issue. And obviously, nobody can object to a dialogue. But the dilemma that we face is that you have a constitutional amendment now in Nepal. So what is the kind of mandate that your foreign secretary is going to carry? So if we have a dialogue and we reach some sort of understanding on the boundary, what is the assurance that that understanding will be endorsed by two thirds of the parliament? So I think this is a very basic dilemma that uh, you know, India faces in terms of how to go about this dialogue uh, on the boundary issue. The third point I wanted to make is that the timing of this issue, you know, in India, we have a huge problem on our eastern border uh, with China. And, you know, this is a very major issue in our country uh, 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 and, and has really affected the people. And it is virtually at the same time that we have this big a boundary problem uh, with Nepal. Uh, and we've also seen, uh, you know, very strong activism of China in, in, Nepal, in Nepal's domestic uh, political processes. So somehow, and I, I'm not saying I agree with this, but there is a perception in India that somehow China, uh, you know, stands with Nepal, uh, 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 you know, on some of these issues, uh, 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 you know, relating to the boundary with India. So, you know, these are some sorts of uh, issues that have really complicated uh, the matter. And, you know, broadly, I think our perception, uh, you know, given the background of the present uh, government in Nepal, the communist government of Prime Minister Oli, which achieved this majority, this, you know, spectacular majority on the basis of a very anti-Indian kind of uh, a, 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 a plank. Uh, so we somehow feel that this boundary issue has also become uh, part of this whole strategy uh, uh, of, of the communists uh, in Nepal. Uh, 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 you know, and, and, and so it's not just a question of territory. Of course, uh, 
you know, this issue has to be resolved. This issue is quite old. Uh, earlier, it was only about 35 square kilometers. Now it's increased to, you know, 372. Uh, we are very confident about our position and we have enough documentary evidence. But somehow we feel the issue is now much bigger than just a, a discussion on the boundary. And it has got entangled with a whole lot of other issues. So how to move forward? I mean, we India is on record as saying that, uh, you know, the, the, a positive environment should be created. And fortunately, we see some silver linings. You know, there's been a, a, a conversation on telephone between the two prime ministers on Independence Day. Uh, I think this the media rhetoric and the shrillness has now disappeared, uh, you know, on both sides. Uh, you know, the, 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 there's a very uh, good news for Nepal. The uh, Jainagar Janakpur Kurtha railway line uh, is operational, and you know, the first trains have started uh, moving. Nepal has also, you know, withdrawn a school textbook, which was really like a political, uh, uh, you know, addition to the curriculum on the boundary issue. So there are some silver linings. But I think, uh, you know, in order to move forward, and I think uh, these are the next steps that I would recommend. First is, you know, if Nepal can give India some kind of assurance in terms of, uh, you know, if these boundary discussions are held, uh, th that the outcome will be respected uh, by all the political parties uh, in Nepal. Secondly, I think we need also some symbolic gestures. You know, we have a very strong uh, relationship between our two armies. And I think uh, General Ashok Mehta will testify to that, where the army chiefs of each country are also honorary generals of the other. We have a new army chief uh, in India, and I think you know it would be a very nice symbolic gesture uh, if if this tradition uh, could be continued. And and the third point I wanted to make is we also need some big ticket, uh, uh, substantive issue, you know, substantive project going forward. And I think this will be received extremely well in both countries. And the one project that comes to my mind is the Pancheshwar uh, multipurpose hydro project. Uh, you know, when Prime Minister Modi visited it uh, in August 2014, this was a very high priority uh, item on the agenda of both countries. And uh, unfortunately, it's now six years and the uh, detailed project report has still not been uh, finalized. So I just hope it doesn't go into a slumber again. So if we can revive this project and you know resolve, there are one or two issues uh, uh, that are holding up uh, this uh, agreement. If this can be resolved, say between you know negotiations between the two ministers of water resources, I think this would go a long way in instilling in in further instilling confidence uh, between the two countries. And of course, you know, if, if all these things happen, then we have uh, the foreign ministers meeting coming up with the joint commission. Uh, and as, you know, uh, Foreign Minister Thapa said, the foreign secretary dialogue uh, should also take place. So, I, you know, I do see some silver lining. And uh, I think uh, the time is right now to really begin a dialogue process, you know, between neighbors which have a relationship which is as close, even intimate, as between uh, India and Nepal. Uh, it's not a good idea, you know, to 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 sort of allow uh, things uh, to drift. So I hope very much that we will soon see normal uh, cooperation and activities resuming uh, between the two countries. Thank you, Ashok. Yeah, thank you, Ranjit, uh, for uh, outlining uh, the more recent issues, especially your listing. Uh, the steps that need to be taken uh, to restore relations on an even keel. Um, I just want to make one point. I have absolutely uh, uh, no issues on all that you have said. But on one issue, I am uh, a little hesitant to agree with you. And that is on the issue of uh india responding to the several calls made by the government of nepal after the issuing of the map and the building of the road for a conversation and uh, i just want to leave it at that that india could have responded more positively and maybe we might have preempted 
the constitutional amendment bill. I'm just saying maybe, but I don't think perception wise, India um, appeared to have been uh, taking these steps positively. But I will allow Ambassador Beg Bahadur Thapa after I have said a few words uh, to respond to what Ambassador Ranjit Ray has said. Uh, I will not take too much of time because both the speakers have uh, really uh, hit the uh, nail on the head. Uh, I will only cover one issue that Ambassador Ranjit Ray referred to, and that is what I call the Gurkha connection. Uh, one of the strongest parts or the sinews that binds India-Nepal relations is our military to military connect. And um, that issue is as old as history. And the relations of the, uh, between serving soldiers, the relations between Indian ex-servicemen in Nepal, uh, that's absolutely, absolutely a vi very vital link uh, that connects these two countries. In my view, it is one of the most enduring constituencies that India has created in its favor in Nepal. And this word Lahore is about Gurkhas of Nepal joining the Indian army at Lahore to join the Maharaja Ranjit Singh Sikh armies. And since then, that connection has not ceased. We have had many joint institutions between the two countries. Uh, one was referred to by Ambassador Ray about the chiefs of each other's countries being uh, the army chiefs of the other country. In other words, the army chief of Nepal will come to India and be given the sword uh, by the president of India. And similarly, uh, that, um, that privilege is reciprocated by the president of Nepal for the army chief. And uh, as Ambassador Ray has suggested, it would be a good idea uh, to, in order to break the ice, to invite the army chief, General Narvane, against whom uh, there are allegations in Nepal uh, because he is supposed to have said, or actually he did say, that what Nepal is doing on the map issue is largely at the behest of the Chinese. That was uh, not a very wise comment, but even so, uh, that privilege and that relationship can be restored. Uh, we have, as, as you know, a, 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 the institution of uh, security cooperation, India and Nepal, which was set up uh, during the, uh, when the Nepalese army was engaged against the Maoists, uh, that has endured. In, in 2004, the Indian army zealously fought its external affairs division uh, when the government of India stopped lethal arms aid to Nepal because King Gyanendra had dismissed the elected government and had ca carried out in 2004 a virtual coup. And that led to this spat between the Indian army and its Ministry of External Affairs when they stopped providing military aid and the Indian army very seriously wanted that to continue. In the end, the Foreign Affairs Division uh, prevailed and that military aid was restored, was not restored and restricted to non-lethal equipment. The, the Nepal Army enjoys the highest number of vacancies in military cooperation in training slots. And, uh, and it's no wonder that uh, the Indian security forces have been the first responders to any crisis inside Nepal. I recall 
um, there was a Thai international airways air crash and Indian uh, half a dozen Indian helicopters were uh, rushed into Nepal to help uh, uh, to locate and restore those bodies. Uh, similarly, the earthquake in 2015, Indian Army was the first responder. Now, during the COVID, uh, milit um, medical equipment has been provided and uh, ventilators provided to the Nepal Army. Uh, joint military exercises are held regularly. Joint seminars are held. So this is the most fruitful relationship of of a joint adventure. It's a joint venture beyond compare. And if we could only replicate this in the political and uh, in the diplomatic sphere, it would be great. Um, on the people-to-people -people relationship, Ambassador uh, Ranjit Ray uh, observed that this they were really low. And I think it is, and he's given the reason. And there's something that we need to do about this. Uh, while I wait for questions in the from the audience, let me uh, move on to some questions for uh, Ambassador Beg Bahadur Thapa. And my first question is on the present political situation in Nepal, would it be correct to assume that the power struggle with, within the Nepal Communist Party is over for the time being and that political stability, which has been the hallmark of Nepal's slogan, Pros uh, stable Nepal, prosperous Nepal, would you say very briefly, Ambassador Thapa, is the past struggle between Prime Minister Roli and the executive chairman of the Nepal Communist Party, uh, Prachanda, is that over, Ambassador Thapa? Well, I listened very carefully what Ambassador uh, Ranjit Ray outlined. And the only, thing, the only thing I want to add to that is to supplement it by saying that differences notwithstanding, dialogue must not be muted for a long period of time. And I think there's a sense of hurt during the time of our constitution writing when India, we call blockade, India calls you know, sort of voluntary restriction. To punish the people in their daily life, to impact on their daily life by a you know, by punishing the people to extract benefit from the regime. I think that sense of hurt has been so widespread and spreads among all the people. You know, I think that is something to keep in mind. Now, coming back to your question, uh, General Sof, I think looking at the history of Nepal from 19... 60 in 1952 until now. There has been the dialogue and interaction between Nepal and India has been so extensive and deep. It has not, has crossed across all a, a, a spectrum of human endeavor. So, uh, you know, we have moved from strong monarchy to constitutional monarchy to republic in a span. You know, and you know the change that has come before Nepalese population is so challenging. And at the moment, you know, there is the governor is a, is, is a uh, party party system or party list system. Differences between individuals have cropped up, give, you know, making Nepal a very unstable country, regardless of political system. So people are confused. You know which system is better. There are new questions being raised now at the people's level in dismay that, especially on the face of this pandemic, you know I think the people's daily life and survival is affected. People are moving from one 
crisis to another crisis just to be able to feed themselves. At a time like this, I think relation between two close neighbors should be mindful of the kind of challenge that both India and Nepal face. Well, you know, I'm not a keen observer of personality or pro group or other difference between parties or within the party. But I think uh, the latest indicator is, indication is that they have passed up their differences. But then that is so uh, internal to Nepal, not, not only to Nepal, but also within the party, that I do not wish to get into that and make a forecast. But I think things are moving in the right direction, although not in a, at a speed desire desire satisfying the population at large. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Ranjit, would you like to respond to the comment made about the blockade? Because there is a question by uh, Mr. Yogendra Kumar, and his question is, can the ambassadors explain their respective positions on the issue of the blockade? Ambassador Thapa has already made that point about the hurt that it costs to the ordinary people. Ambassador Ray, would you like to respond to that? Uh, yes, I can, uh, Ashok. I was there uh, uh, at the time uh, that this constitutional crisis was going on. And, you know, basically it was uh, a, a big controversy between a certain section of Nepalese society uh, uh, and, and the leadership that was drafting the constitution in terms of the nature of the constitution and whether uh, previous commitments that had been made, uh, particularly following the Madesi agitations of 2007 and 2008, uh, would be upheld and respected and implemented. And if you recall, uh, you know, India was a facilitator in the resolution of the problems uh, in 2007 and 2008 uh, at the request of the then Prime Minister uh, Girija Prasad Koirala. So, you know, the position that the government of India had taken, and, you know, I can say this, uh, our Prime Minister has also said this when he went to Nepal, you know, was that if you have an inclusive constitution which accommodates the aspirations of all sections of society of Nepal, this will, uh, you know, this will result in meaningful and durable stability uh, and uh, you know especially for india which borders the tarai where uh, the uh, you know uh, a third of, of nepal's population lives uh, instability in that area uh, would create certain vulnerabilities and would also have implications for india's own security uh, leave alone the matter of the nature of the cross border relationship uh, uh, in in that area and other areas for that matter uh, so, you know, our view, it was not prescriptive, but was that, you know, please take everybody along. And, you know, this agitation was going on for some time. And, of course, the great earthquake of 2015 happened that expedited the whole process of constitution, uh, 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 you know, finalizing the constitution, you know, amidst huge agitations that were going on. Several people had been killed. Uh, uh, so after the constitution was adopted, uh, things took a turn for the worse. And the Madesi protesters started picketing uh, border check posts. And that is how that had major implications in terms of uh, availability of supplies. And in Nepal, of course, a lot of the blame was uh, uh, placed on India for not doing anything uh, to have these uh, you know, pickets removed and to have supplies uh, resumed, even though we had a lot of the trucks, etc., lined up on our side. But, you know, to be fair, I, you know, to, to us, it's not as if uh, no supplies were going. Even at that stage, you know, the other check posts were open. Of course, the main one in Raksol and Birgan was closed and there were problems of oil and gas supplies. But, you know, stuff was going in from the other side. Uh, our view was that, look, this is a political problem between, you know, sections of your society uh, and the leadership. You resolve the political problems or uh, things will ease up. And I think, uh, you know, he was paid to this advice because the then Deputy Prime Minister Kamal Thapa came to India. You know, there were certain, the, the First Amendment to the Constitution was adopted and things uh, did ease up. Uh, so, you know, that really is the context 
Uh, of course, this was projected in Nepal as uh, something that India had done, uh, uh, you know, uh, against Nepal. So it was really projected as an Indian initiative rather than something uh, that, uh, you know, a section of uh, Nepal's own society had done. I think one point, you know, you could say, of course, is that perhaps India could have uh, more proactively uh, tried to assist uh, uh, in, 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 in ensuring supplies, uh, uh, you know, and, you know, we did actually, for instance, ATF, which is required by airplanes, we airlifted that uh, uh, to Kathmandu. Uh, medicines was another issue. Those were also airlifted. So it's a, it's a complex issue. I don't think it's yeah. a black and white issue. Yeah, I think and, you've and, taken and, the... So just to go back to your point about the boundary, uh, you, you said if India had responded earlier, perhaps uh, we could have uh, preempted the publication of the new map of Nepal and the constitutional amendment. As far as I'm aware, some efforts were made, but uh, you know these were rebuffed and we were told it's too late. Uh, so that is my understanding. Yeah, there are always uh, two sides to a point. And uh, so we leave it at that. But the larger uh, perception is that India was dragging its feet for various reasons. Um, I have two questions uh, from the audience. And uh, uh, and this question is for Ambassador Beg Bahadur Thapa. Uh, the question is about uh, uh, Chinese interference in the internal affairs of Nepal. Uh, the questioner is saying that uh, uh, when Indians, the, the Indian establishment was seen to be interfering in Nepal, the Nepalese media and uh, everybody raised a hue and cry. Now the Chinese ambassador is all over the place, but uh, one hears very little about it not as much as the objections to Indian interference in its internal affairs. So that's one question. And Ambassador Thapa, there is another question for you from Bharat Bhushan. Uh, I think he's the same Bharat Bhushan who's, uh, who studied Nepal very closely. And he is asking whether the anti-India sentiment is largely confined to the Kathmandu Valley or has it spread outside the valley? Two questions and if you can answer them very briefly. Well, you know, I think from our perspective, the, you know, the historically close and relationship between India and Nepal cannot be compared. We do not compare our friends. At the same time, the emergence of China as, as a power and the technological and other uh, uh, issues making things easier to move. You know, I think whether it's the airline, it's uh, you know or, or other communication or trade is bringing China closer to every market in the world, not just in Nepal. So we, you know, there is no way or, or there is no evidence of Nepal sort of looking at uh, quid pro quo in terms of relation. I think we have, we have dealt ourselves with, with a sense of maturity not to play one against another. I think that will be counterproductive. That will not be good for us. It will not be good for our neighbors as well. So I think to carry it beyond region, uh, including the, in the movement of envoys and all that. There is a feeling here that maybe, you know, uh, this proximity is being stressed beyond uh, region. But at the same time, I think we view our relation with India with uh, entirely op open border with reverse crossing uh, across our, our respective borders, with cooperation in major activities, does not compare with any other country in the world. But that said, 
you know, I think the sensitivity of Nepalese population in terms of the dealings, uh, there has never been any political change in Nepal without directly or indirectly, either consulting or, you know, helping help from neighbor. Part, part of this is uh, uh, natural, but on the other hand, you know, I think we will, will be wise to look at the broader spectrum of what's happening globally and where Nepal is trying to find this place for itself. And if we look at it from that point of view, I think this lopsided uh, analysis will be will become more reasonable. Uh, Master, can I, Ambassador Thapa, can I press you on this? The questioner, rather the question was about whether the Chinese ambassador's interference, because this is public knowledge that she was meeting the president, she was meeting the foreign minister, she was meeting all the leaders. This was in the press. This was on television. So the questioner is asking that, firstly, do you acknowledge that, yes, that this is political interference, like the way the Indian ambassadors in Nepal have been accused of by the media of that interference. And uh, I think that basically the question that the uh, Nepalese media is a little partial to the Chinese vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the government of India. Do you acknowledge well, that? I, you know, you know it's, it's a difficult question to answer, but uh, basically, I think, you know, the, if you are referring to high-handedness uh, based on the movement, you know, I think there has been no restriction for any envoy to meet the high level in Nepal, unlike in India, you know, it's, you, you, most of the ambassadors spend their entire tenure without meeting the prime minister, except socially in Arashwati Bhavan or someplace. So, you know, we are much more from open and uh, accessible from that point of view. But then the, what the press is, press is making uh, aware of um, uh, more than desirable level of contract. And, uh, you know, I, and they are, they, are, they, are, they are sort of bringing it out as part of their exercise. And I would not want to get into that. But then I think the Chinese role in, in Nepal will continue to increase that much, you know, I think because of their standing, because of their capacity and also easing of the situation. Now look at the air travel. There are more Chinese aircraft coming into Kathmandu than from India. Uh, the trade is expanding, but in, in limited state. But India itself is trading more with China than with many other countries combined. So let's not muddy things up by over-reading the situation. You know, if there is over-exposure or over sort of uh, arcing of events, the press will make us aware of it and probably put a curve on it. Yeah, you have another question about uh, the anti-India, uh, you're the second. Yeah, Bharat Bhushan's question, you know, I think is, is now that, you know, the communication has expanded, Nepal has become more consolidated, unlike, you know, two, three decades ago, you know, where to cross, we go to one, one part of the Nepal by taking Indian Railroad to, to other part. Things have sort of changed. So communication moves fast, and with the expansion of communication gear and all that, I think if you look at the voting at the parliament, that the best indicator of national consensus, the, you know, I, I, there is no dissent except one, uh, except one, in, in 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 adopting our constitution of constitutional amendment. So in a sense, you know, I think we are also coming together as a nation by overcoming geogra geographic obstacles of the past. So whatever happens in Kathmandu is not only in Kathmandu. 
I think it happens in Viratnagar, it happens in Nepal Ganj, and in other parts. Things are moving so fast that we are communicating with each other on a momentary, at a moment's notice. So I think the country, the Nepal is moving towards a consensual political and uh, development system. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, I have a question for Ambassador uh, Ranjit Ray. Uh, I recall uh, Ranjit, uh, I think it was 2016, you were addressing a conference in Nepal Ganj and you uh, painted a very rosy picture and uh, it, it was very accurate at the time. And this is soon after Prime Minister Modi had visited uh, Nepal and as, uh, you, as, as Ambassador Thapa said, that he charmed the people of Nepal. And you said something like this, that uh, the progress made in Nepal in the last six months, I'm talking about to, 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 to 2016 when you were ambassador with a number of projects have been taken off. Uh, you said that the progress made in the last six months was more than the progress in the last 30 years. Can you recount that conversation? And, and bits of that uh, presentation, because those were the good days. Uh, well, certainly, uh, you know, I think there was a big uh, impetus to our bilateral cooperation. And, uh, you know, many of those projects, projects have come in, come online. I've already referred to the, you know, the railway line project. Others are on the, uh, you know, on schedule. There's the oil pipeline project uh, that has also uh, been inaugurated integrated check posts are doing well. So several of these connectivity and other projects uh, are online. But I think we need really some big ticket project like Pancheshwar, because this will really transform the economy of far western Nepal, which is a very poor uh, uh, and less developed area, and of, uh, you know, Kumao uh, in Uttarakhand. And I think this will really transform the nature of the relationship between the two countries. So while there has been progress, I think much more uh, needs to be done. Uh, uh, and we shouldn't allow some of these uh, uh, projects that, that have been pending for some time now uh, to sort of, uh, you know, to be forgotten. So which is why I was, you know, stressing again and again that we need some big ticket uh, project that will really cement the relationship between the two governments uh, and the peoples. Uh, Ranjit, and I think we'll have our last question. We have a last question, and I think this question is for Ambassador Beg Bahadur Thapa. I'm wondering if you would like to say something on uh, very briefly on the eminent persons group. You referred to it in your opening remarks because the eminent persons group seems to be a good confidence building measure uh, if it is viewed as a joint venture not if it is viewed because it is a joint venture so would you say a few words on this very briefly before we close the conference well that initiative was taken by two prime ministers in their wisdom to look at India-Nepal relation from the historical past until present and to outline a path for the future. In a sense, it was a joint, it, it was a single operation jointly led uh, and uh, membership with membership. We have completed our work. Koshiariji has the Indian side of the report. I have the Nepali side of the report to, we are waiting for the two prime ministers to agree to a time frame to receive the report because it is their property, their initiative. What to do after this will be up to the two prime ministers, depending on what instruction they issue to respective governments. But yes, let me only, I, I cannot go, go into the depth of the content of the report, but let me only say that we have left no stone unturned to review and look forward, look towards a future 
which is more congenial and consistent with the proximity of the two countries and two peoples. So to erase or to subside the points of discontent or content from, you know, from historical past until now and to chart our map out our road for the future. And I think it was a unanimous report. It was not the Nepal versus India report. Uh, so I think there's a single report. All of us have agreed. Koshiari and I are, are waiting patiently for submitting to our respective governments. And the last, meet, the last meeting, since it started in Nepal, you know, I think we wanted to conclude in India. That was the understanding of all eight of us, unanimous. And, I, you know, I think we're waiting patiently. We have, but let me only add here that regardless of what happens to the report, I think issues that have been addressed remains, will remain a focal point for joint effort towards improving relationship. Thank you. It was, Thank you. Very, it was a very heartwarming process and tag end of my career to be involved in something like this was a reward. I would always cherish. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations, Ambassador Thapa. I think that joint effort, the joint venture between India and Nepal, the eminent person group uh, report uh, is highly awaited. I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you will agree that uh, this discussion, the webinar on India-Nepal relations uh, has been very enriching, very frank, with a great deal of candor, and that's not that simply because we've had two excellent speakers with a vast store of knowledge and experience about India-Nepal relations. We could not have had a better panel than what we have had today. And uh, I go away, I'm sure like you, with these thoughts that to restore India Nepal relations, which are at one of their lowest points in history, we have to improve the people to people relations. Because as Ambassador Ray pointed out, that the media has been a mischief maker, the media on both sides, neither side is clean on this. So we've got to get the, need, the media on our side to restore these relations. That's the first point that he makes. As far as government to government is concerned, Ambassador Thapa talks about unmuting, that this dialogue process must start. And as Ambassador Ray said, that that has started. Uh, Prime Minister Roli uh, spoke for 11 minutes on 15th of August to Prime Minister Modi. Ambassador Nilambar Acharya in New Delhi met National Security Advisor Ajit Doval. And so that's a forward step. And I believe that there are more steps in the in the future of foreign secretaries the foreign ministers could mute meet over the joint commission so i think we are headed towards an upward trajectory in india nepal relations uh, ladies and gentlemen on your behalf and on behalf of the india international center uh, may i thank ambassador beg bahadur thapa and Ambassador Ranjit Ray for taking part in this seminar or webinar and enriching us with their vast experience on India-Nepal relations. We will have our next neighborhood series conference next month on a neighborhood country, and I hope you will join us then. Till then, goodbye and namaskar. Thank you, Thank you. very much. Thank you. Thank you, Asif. Thank, thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Ranjit. Thank you.